learned colleagues, uh, dear students, I have never been to Coimbra before, but uh, I can assure you that this is very much like a homecoming. Primarily because, as you just heard, this is my first lecture, actually my first visit at the university after a tumultuous year in politics, in the Eurogroup, in Brussels, in Frankfurt, in various seats of government and power. In my Twitter page, I describe myself as um, someone who was living the life of an obscure academic very happily, writing abstract texts that only about 20 people read, <laughs> truly read, not claim that they have read, um, until thrust upon the public scene by the inane handling of an inevitable crisis. Of course, the crisis in question is the Eurozone. This is not the whole truth. Over a period of time, from the actually early 1990s onwards, life in the academy was not as um, shadow-free and carefree as that description on my Twitter page claimed that it was. Given that this is my first opportunity to address an academic audience after many months of very stressful engagement in other fora, I, I hope you will allow me to draw a comparison and a connection between academic values, academ academic freedom on the one hand, and democracy, which is the topic of today's lecture. Now, from the very beginning of my academic career, I believed very strongly that anyone who wanted to be dean of a school or head of department should be disqualified from that position. <laughs> the whole point of being an academic, the beauty of being an academic, is that it's an oasis that allows you to make a living out of reading, discussing, writing, teaching, why would you want to be an administrator? <laughs> now, the only answer which is consistent with this love of the academy is that somebody has to do it. Which means that to be a good administrator and a good academic, you must be a reluctant administrator. It must be something you do as a sacrifice, a genuine act of public service, which you don't enjoy doing except for the altruistic pleasures that you get from contributing to the community of scholarship in which you want to carry on existing. I believe that something similar should apply to politicians. I believe that anyone who really wants to be a government minister, especially finance minister, should be disqualified. <laughs> when I threw my hat, in, my, my hat into the ring of uh, party politics about a year ago, I can assure you I felt that way. It was not an easy decision. It was not a happy decision. It was not something I did gladly. The idea that I would be um, a minister terrified me, especially a Minister of Finance of a bankrupt state, but that's another matter. <laughs> and I believe that in precisely the same way that in a community of scholarship, those who administer must do so in spite of themselves, and as a result of a sense of public duty, similarly, we must all be politicians in our political society, but those who want, to, those who actually move into the positions of government, should be doing so reluctantly or not do so at all. The idea that power is an elixir, the idea that power is uh, to be cherished and to appreciate it, is fundamentally, profoundly antagonistic both to the values that we have in this room and to the values of democracy. Because the whole point about democracy, if you believe Aristotle, that is, 
is that it should be an opportunity for the underprivileged to influence the conditions of their lives. That's how Aristotle de defined democracy. It's rule by the poor, rule by the privileged, the, by the underprivileged, as opposed to aristocracy. By definition, the underprivileged are in the majority. So if you believe in majority rule, if you believe in democracy, you believe in the rule of the underprivileged. Now, of course, you can't guarantee that. So democracy is only a chance at that, just like a court does not guarantee justice, it offers a chance of justice. The problem with both communities that I just described, the community of scholarship, the university, and political society is that the great concepts and values which we all, I think, deep down share, but also that are part and parcel of uh, our collective milieu, these very important values and principles are not sincerely held by those who have the power to determine the life of academic communities, as well as the life of everybody in society. There is friends, colleagues, students, unfortunately, a widespread platonic contempt for democracy in the seat of power in Europe. 25th of June 2015 was a day when in the Eurogroup, the Troika of lenders, that you are familiar with as well here in Portugal, <laughs> presented me with, in the context of the Eurogroup, with an ultimatum. It comprised three chapters. One was a fiscal plan for the next three years, 2015-2018. There was a sequence of reforms. And also, the third and most important part, the funding proposals by the Troika on how to keep the Greek state going despite its insolvency. We looked at that ultimatum, and it took about five seconds to recognize that it was not viable. It was not a question of like being left-wing, right-wing, pro-Troika, against Troika. I don't believe there was anyone who had the intelligence of a 12-year-old that did not see that that was not a viable proposition. It was not presented to us because the, those who presented to us are not intelligent people. It was a program that was presented to us to force us to accept it in order to humiliate a government that dared say no to the Troika. It's very simple. Our response, two days later, we had a follow-up with Eurogroup on the 27th, which I had the good fortune <laughs> or not such a good fortune, to convey in that meeting, was that what I said to them was, colleagues, this ultimatum, this proposal, is not one which I, as an economist, as an intellectual, as a politician, as a European, can accept because it involves new loans under conditions which I know come with a 100% probability that we will not be able to repay these new loans. Neither these new loans nor the old ones. I do not have the moral authority or the political mandate to say yes to this. At the same time, our government is a pro-European government. We are committed Europeanists and we are not in the business when I'm not standing here in front of you, sitting here in front of you in the Eurogroup in order to oppose the Eurogroup, in order to create a rupture, since you are giving this, to me, this uh, proposal to me as an ultimatum, saying no to you would mean conflict between the Greek government and the organized views of the Eurogroup, of the Eurozone. So what we have decided to do was to do that which every Democrat ought to be doing. We are going to take your proposal to the Greek people. We are going to allow them to read it and then a week from today, they will be invited to go to the polling stations and say yes or no to this proposal. And if they say yes to your proposal, we commit that somehow, we don't know exactly how, we will try to implement it. Because we are going to bow to the will of the people. 
If the Greek people say no, we'll come back to you and we will expect a fresh round of negotiations. Now, what happened immediately after I said that is of great importance to all of us. A number of the finance ministers who were sitting around that table who said, I can't believe that you're going to put in front of the Greek public such a complicated document and expect them to have the intelligence to answer with a yes or a no. I nearly had a stroke. <laughs> I said to him, for at least a century, Europe has achieved something called democracy. The very weird and radical idea that complicated decisions of government, of politics, of finance, of economics, of social policy are put to the people on the basis of a one person, one vote. Whether you're rich or poor, educated or completely illiterate, young or old, clever or idiotic, you get one vote, you cast it in a ballot box, and the sum of this exercise, the aggregation of these opinions, determines what, the, what society does. It's, as Winston Churchill said, it is a terrible system, but it is the best of all alternatives. In the Eurogroup, this principle was looked upon as scandalous. In the Eurogroup, we made decisions based on discussions which themselves were based on pure ignorance. Do you know that we, the finance ministers, were never briefed about that which we were discussing? So when we were discussing Portugal, I didn't get any information on Portugal, except that which I read in the press, like you. When we were discussing Greece, the Portuguese finance minister received nothing, precisely nothing in the form of reports, proposals, statistics from us. I was indeed banned as the Minister of Finance of Greece from communicating to the other finance ministers our proposals. I was told in no uncertain terms that it would be considered an act of bad faith to send by email to my colleagues our Greek government proposals. And the reason I was given was some legalism, which I still have not managed to wrap my mind around, that if I do that, then several finance ministers will have to table these proposals to their parliament, and then all hell will break loose. All hell will break loose? Why? Remember the Republic? He was a committed anti-democrat who believed, like the Eurogroup believes, that the people out there do not have what it takes to make important decisions of state. So all this talk about democracy is a smokescreen for a platonic contempt for democracy. But it's not just that. Let me go back to the university setting just for a second. Academic freedom, which is the essence of inquiry, of research. Let's not forget that science emerged on the basis of an anti-establishment energy. The idea, if you walk into the Royal Society in London, the first scientific society of note, what it says on top of the uh, gate is on no one's word. That is, we don't care who you are and what you think. You may be the Pope, you may be the King of England, you may be a renowned scientist. We're not taking your word for it. We are going to inquire into it. We are going to do research, we are going to take your theories and working hypotheses to the laboratory, we are going to put them to the test, and we are going to keep torturing this hypothesis of yours until it confesses. This is what science is all about. Now, this academic freedom is synonymous in law and in politics. After Adam Smith, David Ricardo, after David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, Karl Marx. What did these great thinkers have in common? What they had in common was they didn't 
give a damn about university authorities. They were independent, well, men in this case. I was going to say men and women, but it was men. They were independent thinkers, independent scholars, who had independent means. David Ricardo was, by the way, did you know that David Ricardo was the first, with, together with his brother, financier to have lent the Greek state? Because the Greek state acquired the debt before it came into being. During the revolution, we took a, a huge loan, so we were bankrupt before we created our state. We have a long history. <laughs> and David Ricardo was one of the lenders. But David Ricardo, who wrote his Principles of uh, Political Economy and who was a great inspiration for all the other economies that followed, including Karl Marx, he was a free man. He wrote that which he thought reflected the truth. He went against his own social class. He was a landowner. And he made his name by lambasting landowners as those people whose activities, economic activities, undermined progress. He could do this because he didn't have to apply for research grants. He did not have to go through the hoops of promotions. He did not have to satisfy university administrators who in turn usually have to satisfy their political masters in Lisbon, in this case, Athens or Cambridge. So when I was your age and very keen to stay within the university as an academic, I saw the university, as I think we all see it, an oasis from the marketplace, an oasis from a world in which the customer is always right, a place where the customer is never right. At some point in our great universities, we were told that we should treat students as customers. Well. That's the end of the university. The customer is always right. The customer is always right because the customer knows what he or she wants. And they have every right to want that which they want. If you don't like the tomatoes that you purchased, it's your business to know that these were not the tomatoes that you were seeking. But when you come to university, by definition, you don't know what you want. Because if you did, you wouldn't need to come to university. <laughs> yeah? So the moment we are forced by administration, by the, by the Ministry of Education, by the exigencies and impositions of quantification. The moment we are asked to treat students as, as customers, we are effectively being asked to serve their prejudices. But our job is to liberate students from their prejudices, which means to confront them, which means to ask them to read things they do not want to read, which means that examining them on topics that they do not want to be examined on, which means effectively to convey to them that which Ludwig Wittgenstein so succinctly said, described as, the true liberty, which can only come through constraints. In economics, those of you who have suffered economics, oh, let me just refer to the first chapter of the first uh, book that any economics student ever reads. It doesn't matter who wrote it, it's the same. It defines the object of study. It says, if, especially if it's microeconomics, economics is a study of the efficient allocation of scarce resources between competing means. That's what we economists do. We take the obvious and we narrate it in non-obvious terms because we understand the power of monopoly. <laughs> and then the next stage is to say that um, uh, we like all scientific discourses, like Euclid, you begin with assumptions, with your axioms. Our axiom is going to be that uh, since our object of study will be individuals and their economic decisions, 
we are going to assume that individuals are rational agents who make choices within their constraints in order to maximize something that is called utility. Yeah? This is how economists begin. And then, in departmental board meetings, they also like to protest that it's a real science because it doesn't need the rest of the social sciences. Because it's a mathematical science. They tell their students that rationality is defined as the efficiency with which one maximizes one's utility, which is the most charged philosophical hypothesis I can ever imagine. And then they tell them that there's no philosophy in economics, <laughs> which is, of course, the worst kind of philosophy. Because in order to argue that there's no philosophy in economics, you need to have a philosophical argument. And if you deny that you need it, then you don't have it, so you end up with bad philosophy, bad economics, and terrible mathematics. <laughs> the diminution of our democracies and the diminution of academic freedom in our universities coincided historically. And they coincided with something else which you are familiar with, financialization. And it all began sometime in the 1970s, especially after the 15th of August of 1971. I like giving dates. <laughs> Do you know what happened on the 15th of August 1971? Bretton Woods ended. What was Bretton Woods? It was the first post-war phase of international global capitalism that the Americans created, the New Dealers created at Bretton Woods in 1944, and which effectively set the parameters for the post-war growth that gave rise to the European Union. And also to that golden age of capitalism during which unemployment was low, inflation was low, growth was high, inequality shrank for the first time in the history of capitalism, those of you who've read Thomas Piketty will know that, or Joseph Stiglitz, or Jamie Galbraith. Inequality shrunk, growth grew. People could imagine that the future would always be better than the past. Today, the future is not what it used to be. In 1971, that first global design put in place by the New Dealers, collapsed. During that Bretton Woods period, between 1944 and 1971, bankers lived a rather frugal life. To be a banker in 1960 was not a great deal. You made a bit more money than other people, but not that much more. You were highly constrained in what you could do. Exchange rates were fixed between all the currencies, or quasi-fixed. They could change only by agreement between governments, once in a blue moon. Capital controls were in place everywhere. You could not take large, vast mountains of money and by touch of a button take it from one country to another. Bankers did that which we always assume bankers do, which is they take the money from Jack and they lend it to Jill and they make some money out of the interest rate differential. They give a lower interest rate, they pay a lower interest rate to Jack and they extract a larger interest rate to Jill. This spread is what one would have thought is the source of bankers' profit. That was the case until 1971. In 1971, that post-war phase ended. I'm not going to, I wouldn't need to give you a different lecture as to why it ended. I'm not going to do this. It happened on the 15th of August when President Richard Nixon announced that the connection between the dollar and gold was severed. The United States of America, just to be br brief on this, could no longer support this huge global system because that global system relied on American surpluses. America understood that to be truly hegemonic, it had, as a surplus nation, which it came out of the Second World War as, it had to recycle its surpluses to the rest of the capitalist world in order to allow 
for Europe and Japan in particular to produce the incomes which were necessary for Europeans and the Japanese to purchase commodities and services from the United States to keep the United States going. A kind of surplus recycling. The Americans understood that. The problem was that they could no longer do it. Why? Because they lost their surplus position. They went into deficit. So that, that edifice that they created from in the 1940s, and which they designed so meticulously, and I would say intelligently, collapsed. This is the beginning of the euro. Because remember, we created the European Union not like states are being created. States, nation states, are the result of social conflict. In the United States, it was the slave-owning landowners of the South with the merchants of the East Coast of New England, with later on the industrialists of Illinois and Chicago, the rising working class and the trades union movement, those four social groups and many others clashed quite mercilessly, and American democracy, the American Constitution, all its amendments, Congress, was the mechanism by which American society tried to equilibrate the social conflict. Same in Britain, same in Portugal. This is how the nation state emerged. It's not how the European Union emerged. The European Union emerged as part of the Bretton Woods design of the Americans as a cartel of heavy industry. The Americans were very keen to um, create in Europe the foundation for a strong currency that would act as a shock absorber and as an aid to the dollar. They feared that if the dollar was the only currency, the only tradable currency in the world after 1945, 1946, remember European currencies had uh, ceased to exist after the war, they had become overinflationary, they had collapsed. If the dollar was the only currency, then a recession in the United States would quickly be transmitted to the rest of the world. There would be nothing to absorb those shocks. And then the Soviet Union was lurking in the shadows, waiting to pounce upon a fading capitalism. This was the combination of New Dealer thinking from the New Deal of Roosevelt and the Cold War concerns and worries in Washington, D.C. To have a strong currency in Europe, once pound sterling Britain was dismissed as a basket case, I'm not going to go into this, don't tell the British I said that because I'm going to Cambridge and Oxford next week. <laughs> Inquiries in the Senate led to a simple conclusion by 1946 that it had to be the Deutsche Mark. Because Germany had, despite the catastrophic events of the 1940s, retained a capacity to be a strong industrial center. A currency, a strong currency, requires a strong industrial center. And it was a question of how to convince the French in particular to go into a kind of alliance with Germany in order to recreate a Europe that would stabilize the dollar zone in the context of a global design that the Americans thought was essential to prevent the return of the Great Depression. And they were quite right, the Americans. So what happened in Europe was, to cut a long, very long story, as short as I can, Brussels became the town where a bureaucracy was created to administer a heavy industry cartel, a cartel involving German, Dutch, Belgian, French, and North Italian, initially coal and steel manufacturers, miners. Remember, the first name for the European Union was the European Community of Coal and Steel. Then the farmers, especially the French farmers, were co-opted with a common agricultural policy. Then the bankers were co-opted. So let me put it very simply. When you see the images of those buildings in Brussels where the European Union bureaucrats are making decisions on behalf of all of us. Remember, they are there to administer a heavy industry cartel which was later financialized, especially after 1971 and the end of the common currency, which was effectively the dollar until 1971. 
Now, when you are administering a cartel, think of OPEC. The great worry is the instability of any cartel. If you allow for price competition amongst the members of the cartel, it's very easy for that cartel to just fragment. This is why it was important that the exchange rate between Belgium, Holland, France, Germany was stable. And it was stable until 1971. It was actually fixed. It was a common currency. But when the Americans blew up that common currency, the Bretton Woods system, because they could no longer sustain it, and it was a question of them not sinking along with it, with it as they were falling into deficit, suddenly the Deutsche Mark and the French Mark started deviating from one another. The Italian lira was following the United States dollar, and the Dutch guilda was following the Deutsche Mark. So effectively, that cartel, which was the European Union, started being pulled apart. It was being torn apart by these divergent exchanges from the first day. Maybe you've heard of the Werner Report, 1970, the Snake, 1972, the European monetary system that Helmut Schmidt, Chancellor Helmut Schmidt and President Valéry Giscard d'Estaing signed in 1978. Europe immediately tried to graft on top of the cartel a common currency. And all these attempts to fix the exchange rates failed, and failed badly. And because they failed, they came to the conclusion that the only antidote to this failure was a common currency, a single currency, to replace all currencies with one. Now, the problem is that if you do this, if you create a common currency, you end up with something like the gold standard of the 1920s, which was a common currency, a fixed exchange rate regime, putting together disparate economies, surplus economies and deficit economies. The moment you do that, what happens instantly, the moment you do that, and the moment people believe that this is a system that's here to stay, a tsunami of money floods, flows initially from the surplus countries and goes to the deficit countries. Now, why does this happen? When one country, let's say Germany, for example, <laughs> has a massive trade surplus vis-a-vis, -vis, let's use another example, it could be Portugal, let's say it's Greece. Since I have a connection with that place. <laughs> when you bind together their currencies, for every Mercedes-Benz that gets sold in Greece, there is the money that flows from Greece to a Frankfurt bank. The larger the surplus of Germany, the greater the lake of euros in the Frankfurt banks. The greater the lake of euros in the Frankfurt banks, the lower the price of money in Germany. The more you have of it, the lower the price. What's the price of money? It's the interest rate. So the interest rates in the surplus countries have a tendency to be depressed. In countries like Portugal and Greece, where the money is flooding out to go to Germany to buy Mercedes-Benz and Volkswagens. Oops, I shouldn't have used that word. <laughs> in places like Portugal and Greece, in the deficit countries, what happens is interest rates tend to rise because there is a shortage of capital, a shortage of money. Now, if you're a banker in, in, in Frankfurt, what do you do? If you, you have all this money sitting there. You need to lend it out because there is no curse worse for a banker than to have money that, they, that is not being lent out. But if you lend it out in Germany, the interest rate is very low. But if you lend it in Portugal or in Greece or in Spain or in Ireland in the periphery, then the spread is great. It doesn't matter where you lend it. You just want to lend it. You lend it to other banks. You lend it to uh, governments, like in Greece. Um, you just lend it. You just, you just want to get rid of it. Yeah? So what I'm saying is this. The euro happened because our European Union, upon which we had invested all our hopes for a European democracy, and I still have my hopes on the European Union for a European democracy, and we should still keep these hopes, but we should be rational, we should use our academic curiosity and harsh judgment in order to pass judgment on the European Union that we now have. It, create, it began life as a cartel.
And then we grafted upon it a currency, a currency that was never controlled by any democratically elected parliament. Because we have a parliament in Brussels, but only in name, not in reality. They have absolutely no authority over anything that's happening in Brussels or in Frankfurt for that matter. It's a nice building, that's it. What happens when you create a huge economy, a very advanced economy like the Eurozone, and its money is not subject to democratic checks and balances? You end up with a democratic deficit and with catastrophic economic policies. We've managed to create the only economy in the world where there is a central bank without a government behind it and governments without a central bank behind them. This has never happened anywhere in the world. So creating a single currency without putting in place the shock absorbers, both economic shock absorbers and democratic shock absorbers, to control it, to maintain it, like the United States have done, where Congress has the, the, the capacity, the right, even to uh, impeach the president, to get rid of Janet Yellen, if they want to. Who can get rid of Mario Draghi? I don't want to, to see Mr. Draghi go. I think he's an excellent central banker. But Tony Benn, the British left-wing politician, once made a very good point that you can accept independently of your own political position. He said that in a democracy, we have to be able to put several questions to our representatives and to expect an answer from them. What powers do you have? Where did you get them from? Who gave them to you? How do you use them? For what purpose? And how can we get rid of you? <laughs> and if there are no good answers to these questions, we don't live in a democracy. We can go to the polling stations, we can vote, we can elect people, yeah? But we don't have a democracy. We have a semblance of democracy. We have something that looks like democracy, which, as Shakespeare might have said, is confirmed in the breach not in the observance. Creating such a single currency without the shock absorbers, economic and democratic, is a bit like invading Russia. At first, it's great. <laughs> Ask Napoleon or Hitler. Very rapid progress. Eventually, the winter comes. And those Russians, and they take their toll, and it all ends with blood on the snow. That's the Eurozone. 2000, we created the Eurozone, and it was splendid. The tsunami of money was flooding Portugal, Spain, Greece, Ireland from the banks of Frankfurt. A lot of it was going through the banks of Paris, Ben Pepe, Paris, Paris, and so on. And it was coming to us in a variety of forms. In the case of Greece, we created a wonderful Olympic Games 2004. We still have these white elephants sitting there doing nothing. <laughs> Corruption flourishes in places like Greece. Um, here it went into um, private debt. You have a huge amount of private debt in this country. Yeah? It is completely unsustainable. So do the Dutch, by the way. These, this flood of debt is the other side of the coin of the great gleaming factories in Holland, in Germany, that are churning out all these wonderful products. They are wonderful. I'm not saying this ironically. But the rest of us in the periphery, in this ill-fated and ill-designed Eurozone, resemble the person who goes to a car dealer and says, oh, I'd like this car, but I can't pay for it. And then they, get, they leave the forecourt of the dealer with two things, the car and the loan. That's the periphery of Europe. Eh? During that debt-driven growth, I call it Ponzi growth, from Charles Ponzi in the United States. If you know what this means, it's okay. If not, it's okay again. <laughs> um, this Ponzi growth, pyramidic growth, eventually runs out of puff. 
In 2008, just like in 1929, Wall Street collapsed for similar reasons. But the United States had the shock absorbers. We didn't in Europe. This is why the United States has been recovering for a while, and we are not recovering. We claim we are recovering. You know, our governments claim that Portugal, Greece, and last year Greece was on the verge of a turnaround, that you are growing now, that Spain is doing well. It's sad. It's very sad. There is no growth in Europe. We have deflation. We have a slow-burning recession. We never managed to extricate ourselves from the great crash of 2008, 9, 10. We have investment that is the lowest in the world. We have young people of the universe taking away their skills and depleting the human stock of our countries. And our leaders have the audacity to celebrate the turnaround. What turnaround? The rest of the world is looking at Europe and they're laughing their heads off, except they're crying because they know that our inability to recover is impeding their ability to recover too. Where can we have these discussions? Where can we discuss the essence of our problems? Because what I just described is your problem here in Portugal. It's our problem in Greece. It's, it's Germany's problem. It is the problem of millions of working poor Germans who for years have been seeing their standards of living crash while the government is giving billions to our governments. And they don't understand why this is going on, except they start hating the Portuguese and hating the Greeks. And then the Greek workers and the, Greek and the Portuguese workers hate the German workers, which is a repetition of the 1930s all over again. We are moving to a postmodern 1930s because our currency is fragmenting the way the common currency of the 1920s and 30s was fragmented. Now, where can we have this conversation? You cannot have this conversation in your national parliament in Lisbon. Ah, oh, you can have it, but it's irrelevant. <laughs> because your national uh, parliament in Lisbon has no sovereignty anymore. Our parliament in Greece has no sovereignty anymore. What we've done with this creation of a cartel and then the grafting of a currency on top of it is we have sent our sovereignty as a body politic to Brussels. But in Brussels, that sovereignty fell into a black hole because the European Parliament there is not equipped to take our national sovereignty and convert it into a pan-European federal sovereignty. It is a parliament which cannot initiate legislation. It cannot say to those who make decisions, you're fired. It is simply there in order to legitimize an illegitimate state of affairs at the heart of Europe. It is not true that the human condition has deteriorated in the last 20 years or so. It isn't. The intelligence of our young people is higher than ever. Their skills and education is higher than ever. Why is it that politicians are so much more inferior, so inferior compared to politicians of yesteryear? I submit to you that the reason has nothing to do with the DNA of politicians. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with a diminution of the human stock that finds itself expressed in Parliament, in government, in Brussels, and so on and so forth. Ask yourself a very simple question. If you were a politician in 1960, 1970, would you have more or less power than you would today? The answer is clear. You would have a lot more power. You could use it badly, as Salazar did, or you could use it well, as some other leaders did, as um, Willy Brandt did, the Chancellor of Germany, for instance. Bruno Kreisky, the Chancellor of, 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 Chancellor of Austria, going to Britain. Um, Harold Wilson in the 1960s. 
brought about a revival of the Labour Party, of, um, of the idea of combining democracy with uh, investment in technology and so on and so forth. But these people today would probably never enter politics. And they wouldn't enter politics because politics is very boring now. You never get your hands on the levers that allow you to do things. All you need to be a good politician these days, and I'm very glad I'm not a good politician, is a capacity to repeat the mantra. As academics, and we are all academics in this room, students, scholars, we are all academics. I think you agree with me that our nightmare is somebody who says to us that things are the way they are because they are the way they are. <laughs> Go to Brussels. This is the mantra. I was trying to have a sensible conversation about the rules regarding primary surpluses. I'm not going to tell you what primary surpluses are, it doesn't matter. And I was trying to make a rational case, an academic case if you want, an economic case. I had the audacity to speak economics in the Eurogroup. <laughs> and I was looked upon as a strange animal, a dangerous <laughs> communist. And indeed, some of my colleagues came out and said that I was so rude because I lectured them on economics. <laughs> what, you know what they were saying to me? But these are the rules. I said, yeah, yeah, no, no, I know these are the rules. But can we discuss the rules? No. <laughs> Why can't we discuss the rules? Because they are the rules. <laughs> In my very first Eurogroup meeting, I gave what I consider to be a very moderate talk, address. It's actually on my website, you can read it. All I said was, you know, we may be a radical left-wing government, but we're not coming here in order to dictate to you to tell you what must happen in Greece, let alone the rest of the Eurozone. We know there is a program, the MOU, the memorandum, you know what this means. There is a memorandum that is, you know, the previous governments in Greece have committed to it, uh, and we need to respect it, yes, because, of course, there is the, the state has a certain continuity. It, it's not you know, we have recreated the Greek state. We are a new government. So we need to respect that MOU, which we dislike. But at the same time, there is another principle, too. It's called the principle of democracy, as such. We have a mandate. We were elected to challenge this MOU. So what happens when you've got two contradictory principles in a democracy? You find an accommodation between them. That's what democracies, liberal democracies do. You take the old text, you take our government's proposals, and you try to blend them. Michel Sapin, the French finance minister, spoke immediately after me, and to his credit, agreed. And he said, we need to establish common ground between Greece's program, the new Greek government's program, and the MOU. And then Dr. Wolfgang Schäuble takes the floor. And he said something spectacularly interesting. Elections cannot be allowed to change anything. <laughs> the combination of the complete radical absence of a discourse, of a discussion about the rules of the Eurozone, which we all know, I hope you agree with me, you don't have to be left-wing, you don't have to agree with me on anything else except for that. The rules we created in Maastricht were designed to fail. They could never work in the same way that the gold standard did not work in the 1920s and 30s and started fragmenting. It was a bit like, let me use another allegory that I like, it's like a fine riverboat with which you try to cross the Atlantic from here and go to the United States. If the weather is good, it's beautiful. The first storm and it starts sinking. These are the rules of Maastricht and of the Eurozone. But there is no way we can have a discussion about it in Europe. In the United States, 
the 19th century and the 20th century and the 21st century. How did the United States evolve? It evolved through crisis, from crisis to crisis. Every time they had a crisis, a financial crisis, they had plenty, they created institutions for, for, for pulling the continent, putting, uh, pulling the United States closer together. 1929, Franklin Roosevelt responded with the creation of Social Security, with the creation of the FDIC for effectively a banking union, not like the one we have here, a real one. Um, and the result was that the United States, when we reached 2008, could weather that storm a lot better. In Europe, we had one crisis of the Eurozone. In 2008, it started and it has been never ending since then. And what have we done? A great deal of marketing. We have created a number of new rules and institutions. Ah, that sounds good, so we've responded. But if you look at each one of them, inside them, against the aura of consolidation that the name emits, what you will find inside them is the seeds of further fragmentation, of further disunion. Let me give you a few examples. First, the European stability mechanism. It should be called the European instability mechanism. <laughs> the bailout fund. If you look at the way that it functions, the way that it borrows from the private sector to lend to Greece, to Portugal, and so on, it uses instruments, financial instruments, that are very much like the ones Lehman Brothers used to use in order to finance itself, like CDOs compartmentalized pieces of debt with a domino effect of the fragmentation of the Eurozone inside each one of these instruments. I could give you a lecture on this, a separate one. Just on that. I won't. So the European stability mechanism promotes instability. And this is why it's been sidelined. That's why poor Mario Draghi had to start printing 60 billion euros a month to buy the Eurozonal debt to keep the whole thing together. Because the ESM, which was created to promote stability, promoted instability. The, but now let's look at what Draghi has been doing. He's been purchasing, as I said, about 60 to 65 billion euros of a lot of, a lot of tension with the Central Bank of Germany, the Buddhist Bank. But if he hadn't done that, there would be no euro now. So I'm not criticizing him for that. But to, to get around the political constraints of the Maastricht rules and the charter of the ECB, he buys, most of the, of the debt that he buys is German. He buys bonds, German bonds. Because he, he's trying to do it in proportion to GDP in Germany so that he's not accused to be favoring Spain or, or Portugal. Eh? But Germany is damaged by that because Germany has too low interest rates. Pension funds in Germany are apoplectic because interest rates are so low in Germany. So when Draghi is trying to save Portugal, and he's doing it, the only reason why you have not gone completely bankrupt in this country is because of QE, or what Draghi is doing, yeah? he creates this problem in, problems in Germany. And that causes greater political tension between the periphery and Germans who see their pensions depleted because of what the ECB is doing. Now, Draghi knows that. He wished that he only bought Portuguese debt, or Greek debt, or Spanish debt, not German debt, but he can't, because he has this iron cage of Maastricht, and the Stability and Growth Pact, and the rules of the European Central Bank. So that's another example. Banking union. We are supposed to have a banking union in Europe, right? Well, we don't. Let me put it this, this way. If I were to give you a million euros, let's say, hand over a million euros to you. Where would you like it? In a Portuguese bank account or in a Frankfurt bank account? In America, that question makes no sense. And America doesn't care whether you put a million dollars in a New York bank account or in an Arizona bank account or a Missouri bank account. It doesn't matter. They don't care. They would have it anyway. They're indifferent. Here, a million in a Portuguese bank is worth far less than a million in a German bank. Why? Because the banking union we have says that if a bank goes under, it has to be bailed out by the state. Well, your state cannot do it. 
So the, 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 the deposits will have to ba be bailed in, which means everything above 100,000 euros is subject to a haircut a la Cyprus. So why would you want to keep the, your million euros in a Portuguese bank account? So we, we, have, not consult we have not created a, a banking union. The, we call it a banking union by which to describe an official banking disunion. I could carry on and on and on. Let me say that I will leave the discussion of what needs to be done for the discussion. And I will wrap it, wrap it up because uh, these monologues um, are fine for me, but uh, you'll be benefiting a lot more if you get a chance to ask me questions. What we need, dear students, dear colleagues in Europe, is a new model of politics. The one lesson I learned in the last year is that the traditional model, where we have a national party, we get elected in the national parliament, and then we try to forge some kind of alliance in Brussels, it doesn't work for this Europe. We have common European problems. We Greeks, you Portuguese, the Germans, the French, we have common European problems. It's about time we got organized as Europeans in the context of a pan-European conversation on what we need to do, on what institutions we want to create, on what to do, we want to do today, next month, two years from now, ten years from now. I have some ideas that I'll share with you in the conversation later. But until we start this conversation, independently of national political party affiliation, you can belong to any national political party you want, but let's join forces together in Europe to have this conversation. And then that conversation is going to take a life of its own. It will be academic in the good sense of being free and fair as an exchange in dealing with the common problems that we all face. And then once we start forging a common view, that common view I'm sure, I don't know how, but I'm sure is going to take an expression at the national and at the local level so that we can start reclaiming European democracy. I shall finish by saying that Take, bringing back this discussion to the level of the universities, because this is where my heart remains. The one thing that separates you from customers is John Stuart Mill's principle of human growth. You're not here to consume, you're here to grow. And so are we, to grow with you in a dialectical process where your growth is our growth and vice versa. This principle of human growth is inimical to the idea of consumer sovereignty. Political sovereignty in Europe has been sacrificed for consumer sovereignty. Europeans have been bribed with more goodies and more shopping malls for the loss of democratic sovereignty over the conditions and the processes that determine their lives. We need to bring this back. William Cowper once said that freedom has a thousand charms that slaves who are contented will never know. Well, democratic sovereignty has a million charms that Europeans, however contented as consumers, will never know. Thank you.